The following video interview is part of the USMC Vietnam Tanker History Project and was recorded at the Vietnam Tankers Reunion in Washington, D.C. on October 30th, 2015. I'd like each of you to introduce yourself with your name, your unit, the year of Vietnam, and the rank that you held while you were in country. Larry Zuli, 1st Tank Battalion in 1967-68. At the time of this in incident, I was a driver for uh, Yankee 5-1 with uh, h and Company as Lance Corporal. My name is Joe Vernon. I was a PFC and a Lance Corporal in Vietnam at the time of the event. Uh, I worked for Headquarters and Service Company. I was the company clerk and then became the battalion clerk. And Jim Seffrens and I worked together in the same office. I'm Steve Falk. I was a corporal at the time with h &S Company. I worked in the S-4. Uh, I was in 0441, I, and that's what I was doing at the time. I'm Jack Schuyler, 1st uh, Tank Battalion, h &S Company. I was the S-4 for one year, from 67, 68, July to July, and uh, uh, I know a little bit about what went on during that year. Okay, our purpose is to reveal personal insights and realities concerning the events of 6 February 1968. Each of us will share background and narrative in the events unfold that night. Additional Marines have requested to learn more and have offered more personal in insights concerning this particular event but they did not come to the reunion this year. And so really, uh, we cannot complete all that is already known, and we, we need to go someplace with it. Uh, Marine personnel involved that night and the deaths of our Marine brothers who were killed and wounded in action in that fury. Why don't you start by talking about what happened to you and what happened in my involvement as far as the activities of the evening was that I was assigned as the uh, reaction squad leader for the night of 6 February 1968. I had a flight date for 9 February 1968. And so I had three days in wake up uh, when these events took place. Jim Seferens was a a sergeant at the time working in S2 uh, as an intelligence specialist came, we were friends, we had spent a lot of time together, came to me that morning and he and I and a handful of other NCOs shared assignments during the Tet Offensive that were changed each morning. He said, what do you have tonight? And I said, squad leader for the reaction platoon, what do you have? He said, I've got perimeter security, just to double check the security in the perimeter. And he said, do you want to trade? And I said, yes. And that was very significant, of course, because that was the end of, that night was the last time I saw it, Jim. Does anybody want to talk about the actual incident, the, the how it happened? That evening, you went to Chow, and then the patrol went out, and and Major called in. And does anybody Jack, have that? Well, I, would you have some insight on that? <coughs> uh, there was a call that uh, came in that there was a problem at uh, one of our positions on the bridge. Tui Long Bridge. Uh, yeah, Tui Long Bridge. Tui Long Bridge, which was a really, really important link to that whole part of the. The whole the, western the part. whole western part i mean the only way to get there was across that bridge Correct. and all the supplies had to go across it was a really really critical uh bridge and i think it was four tanks there five tanks it was a platoon I of tanks wasn't it i thought there was a platoon it was I thought there just wasn't was one or two, two tanks it was a whole platoon of tanks and grunts that i thought it was only two i believe that it was only two tanks okay. at that time okay but it was really an important link oh, yeah. so Absolutely. anything that was going around there that's i mean a big high alert Absolutely. 
And, and the, the initial information came in with the incident uh, for the reaction squad came in at an early request by the uh, Arvins who were nearby, off the location of the bridge, but near the ville itself, that there were NVA present there and they requested the, my understanding is they requested the, the tanks to react to that, which of course they were not going to do. But the, tank, the uh, TC called into headquarters and that uh, initiated the uh, beginning of the reaction return. I think you know more Luke, Was about that. Would that be correct, Jack? Yes. Uh, I think, too, that uh, it began to be more specific from that point on, uh, once the call came in, as to uh, the leadership that was going to and how they were going to react from the CO on down. How many, uh, how many Marines went out uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I was not a part of that when it happened. Uh, we had a few other things going on, but my point no, it, was the, it was the first part of the Tet Offensive, yes. so there was lots of things going well, on all Well, things the country, had, had so. begun a, oh, a, yeah, week, yeah, yeah. a week earlier. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, January 31st or 29th or whatever. When it started. This, this is still stuff going on. So, Absolutely. I mean, and and I, think, I think Casey's... Uh, um, uh, Conwell Casey's platoon was getting ready to move up north to go to yes. White City. So, yeah, yeah. So, it's a lot of tension going on. Yes, that was exactly right. And we had, we had already lost a couple of tanks. Oh. And we were trying to get as many back in the field at that time as we could. Because there was a concern that they were going to be needed more than they had been in mm. the past. Mm. And as a matter of fact, the division headquarters uh, put some pressure on Colonel Gentile to uh, get going. And uh, that's what we were spending uh, a lot of time doing. I had a lot of great guys working on that. Uh, the maintenance officer for the tank battalion uh, at that time was Pierce and uh, he did an outstanding job. Uh, so, uh, and the whole crew did, really. And we were very fortunate to have as many back in and out in the field uh, as we did. So, we, we lost a Bravo tank just that morning, about uh, maybe three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, uh, that had been uh, responding to a cap unit that was uh, under attack and was ambushed. Nearby. Um, I think you, it might have been coming from maybe uh, Hill uh, 39. Um, it wasn't close to the Tui Long Bridge, but I mean- In the they, area. Yeah, we, were, we, we had just lost a tank and uh, the loader was killed. Um, and that, and uh, and the crew wounded from and an RPG came in the, the the loader's side of the turret. And I, I think you should mention who that was. A Jack De Cicero, uh, he who had been on our crew with the Yankee tank and had spent a year. He was uh, TAD eighteen eleven TAD to supply at H and S, and then extended for six months to get back on a tank. And we crewed with us when he got back from his, uh, his leave and was just, had only been out with Bravo Company for maybe a week and, um, and when he was killed. Um, and he was from Decatur, Illinois, and you know, I'd known him for eight months um, back at the, at the, you know, that's where I got my tools for my, uh, my tank. Yeah. So, right. so the, the, but the call from the Arvins, was it Arvins or PFs or whatever called, they were said that they saw some yes. NDA? Yeah. Yes. And so then what, what, was, what, what was the next thing that happened? Does anybody remember, like, what, what was the next thing that happened? There were two the, trucks. Uh, Marine, Marines were gathered throughout H&S Company. Um, two of our, uh, from our section that had been, uh, um, our tanks had moved, had been sent out couple days before to uh, two observation posts above the Caudot River 
and to stay uh, permanently. Typically, we just go out at night, come back. They were staying. Uh, Sergeant Fontenot was our section leader. We had a couple guys, uh, new guys for replacements, and uh, one of them was named Washington. They kept him back because he was just brand new, and um, the other uh, was a. Uh, uh, I think Lance Corporal Leslie uh, Dalton was a gunner, gunner on our tank, but he was short. He was just waiting for a flight date, and uh, Sergeant Fontenot kept him back um, to get his uh, paperwork and affairs in order and, um, because he was short. So the tanks went out. Those two guys were back. The call came out for the reactionary force to go out, and they were uh, grabbed and uh, Washington was given an M60 machine gun and Dalton was given a M79 grenade launcher. And as part of the reaction force because as, they were in the rear. Yeah, and everyone was going. That's where the mo they grabbed the Motor T guys, they grabbed well, everyone. Well, some of the Motor T guys, they, they, this Larry's uh, earlier uh, alluded to the fact that we don't know, none of us, and, and Jack, he asked Jackson, Jack didn't, None of us know how many guys went out. There was the standard Marine Corps squad appointed for that Nine night. Nine people, whatever 14. Yeah, 14. 14. Okay. Okay. Three fire teams, a squad leader, and a, a radio man. That's what the standard assignment was that involved me that morning. Mm. When this thing actually happened, we know that at least double that number went out on two trucks but we don't know how many others, whether it was only another squad. Uh, the, some of the literature, uh, although I'm told that the post-action report is non-existent because of other things we'll hopefully get to talk about later. Uh, but Jack, do you the, know what there the... Were, there were a couple of lieutenants from headquarters yeah, that went that's out, right. too. Yes. One in, one in charge right. of each, one in charge of each of those at least squads. Now they may have beefed up the sides of the squads too, because they went. My understanding is they went, you know, just great, walking into a hooch and saying, "Oh, you guys, you guys, we need you now." And, and as they responded, this this was. Uh, well, the confusion Possibly. is is That's magnified possible. because I personally interviewed all of the wounded that survived. Colonel asked me to, uh, after getting his initial reports from Gentilly and others, um, asked me to prepare a submission for the Medal of Honor for Mr. Seferens. And in that assignment, I was asked to interview all that survived. And one of my questions was, well, how many guys did we send? And all I got was stares, like, I don't know. I don't have a clue. Now, as Steve said, there are certain sizes that go out automatically. 28 guys in our reactionary force. How many more did we send? Another 20? Cooks and bakers and supply guys that just were... I, I didn't well, that's who our reaction yeah, force was. Yes, that's anyway. who it is, yeah. yeah. Got it, got it. But you you any, built any your reactionary force um, as a result of who was left after guard duty, uh, deserving of a night off, whatever. Uh, or patrol, and I had guard duty that night, and so I wasn't asked because I was wasn't there. I was in a bunker. Bunker mm -hmm. not was mm -hmm. in a bunker. Did Jack, do you have any idea what the casualty rate was on that? Uh, uh, I thought uh, that it was six, but I see only five listed here. Uh, for KIA? Uh, yes. How about wounded? Well, there were several of those, including at least one of those two off. Lieutenants. Uh, Lieutenant Harrison was one of the two. Yeah, he, we, got, he, he was, was my wounded. boss. And he he got a uh, oh, our, right that night. The uh, our tanks were out on the hill. We didn't know what was going on, and because um, we you were up you were up at the location. We, yeah, we were no, out on two uh, two uh, observation posts. Yeah, you and, were out uh, there that night. Yeah, yeah, we had been there for about a week. We had fired uh, H and I for a number of nights when we were out there. We'd been resupplied with ammo. They'd bring, uh, uh, periodically, they'd bring a chow truck out with hot, a hot meal for us. But uh, we actually had a, 
a bird dog fly over and uh, drop uh, magazines rolled up and a carton of cigarettes uh, on us because we'd been sitting out there for a week. And uh, he'd fly over every night and then, evening and then this one evening he came over just right over the antenna and the window opens up and out comes this bundle of magazines rolled up. Fine. But uh, so we'd been sitting there. We, we knew there's a lot of radio traffic. We knew something was going on on February 6th, but we'd been stuck on this hill for for almost a week, and um, and then I was about maybe a day or two later, a chow truck comes out, and uh, Sergeant Fontenot was on it, and uh, Leslie Dalton, our gunner, uh, was was out there, and um, he was coming out to relieve Dwayne Stanley, who was our our acting gunner, because he was he had R and R to to get ready for, so the truck brought Dwayne Stanley back and uh, Leslie, he, he come, you know, come off the truck and they brought chow out. Of course, everyone's, you know, interested in uh, getting some chow and Leslie just walks right past, you know, just doesn't say anything, which wasn't his nature at all. He was a, a real nice guy. I'd been uh, crewing with him for eight months and uh, he was from Virginia and um, just a, a just a nice guy, and uh, he just walked right past us all and never said nothing. And I'm like, that eh, something you know something's wrong. So we went into our little tent that we had there with some sandbags around him, just sitting on a rack. And uh, so I went in there and asked him. I said, you're not you know chowing down or nothing. And he just sat there and uh, said, what's the matter? And he said he just uh, he said just it, it was bad. And I'm what are you talking about? And he said. Uh, your friend is dead, Jim Zeffrens. And I said... Oh, well, so this is a couple days after? Yeah, you know, a couple okay. days after. And uh, we still, we have no idea. And he points at his uh, boot down on the, on the ground, and he points at there, and it's half of it's gone <coughs> The uh, from a, a, a bullet hit. And uh, I'm like, you know, tell me what's, what's happening here. And he, then he proceeded to relate what occurred when uh, the reaction force went out. And um, he, uh, he said um, they were back and uh, they came and got him and he got a 79 grenade launcher in Washington. This is during that crazy time they were trying yeah. to assemble. Okay. When they were doing He got a M60 and uh, they loaded him up on trucks. They drove out by the, the uh, Tui Long area and um, they uh, unloaded, they were getting things ready, and there was some some uh, uneasiness uh, with getting the, the uh, force started because there was an uh, argument between uh, a captain and a major. And um, he said, he, you know, it was troubling. They just, you know, it was, wasn't what they'd expected. Let me stop here a second. Okay. Was the captain and the major physically there? With yeah, the, with the group. Yeah, okay. yeah. Another group had, uh, there had the force had separated, and uh, uh, one group was led by uh, Warrant Officer Gunner Carroll, Jim Carroll. He was our company XO. They had moved off to another location. So this unit, which was normally uh, led by the captain, um, uh, was now <coughs> in a discussion with the major and um, according to Leslie it was a heated argument the major took over and formed them up on line and started them off across the rice paddy where they were came under automatic weapon fire immediately uh, Leslie said uh, him and Washington made it to the uh, first rice paddy dike was dry, the uh, uh, rice paddy was dry. But he said there was, there were taken casualties um, all along, you know, the whole length, you know, in advance to the rice paddy. They, they uh, held up there for a bit, and then they were, they were again taken casualties, and uh, he said that was, uh, he'd seen a, a Marine go down that was shot in the leg, and, um, while they were uh, 
you know, still under fire. That's when he saw uh, Sergeant Zephyrins come over and uh, stop and kneel down next to him to uh, take his dressing out, his battle dressing, and put it on the Marine that was hit in the legs. And at that time, uh, Sergeant Zephyrins was hit in the head and, uh, and he fell over. They were ordered then to advance further across the rice paddy and they made it to the second rice paddy uh, still with the uh, M60 and they hit the, got up to the dike with the uh, M60 and got it mounted over the top of the berm when everything just disintegrated right around them with the uh, and M60 was shot to pieces. They, uh, so got the tree line opened up all of a sudden? Like really, again, really big time. yeah, second time. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, uh, um, they, they just were just hit with tremendous automatic weapons fire. At that time, Leslie was shot in the foot. It just took his heel off. It didn't hit him. And then he looked over at Washington and he saw a big hole where his back pocket used to be. And um, he told Washington, he said, you've been hit. And Washington reached back, put his hand on his backside, and it went right into the hole in his trousers, right into the hole in his buttocks. And uh, he said Washington just lost it at that time. So he got him, you know, res you know calmed down, and by then, uh, weapons fire, automatic weapons fire had slowed down a bit because the machine gun was, and they were, no one, it was just basically gone. And he, uh, he, he got uh, Washington gathered up and he gathered up the grenade launcher. They left the, the machine gun lay there and uh, he started maneuvering back across the rice paddies and he, bringing Washington back and he got him back across the rice paddy all in one piece and they got back to a road where the trucks had been parked that brought them and there was a, a lot of wounded you know that were you know gathered up there and he got Washington up there and uh, got him you know settled down and uh, he saw the major um, standing by another truck and he, he looked at him and he said the major is just screaming out of control and he said and I'll never forget he said that major was just hopping up up and down and I, I just uh, exactly the way he put it and if you understood you know you know uh, you know the way you know a guy uh, you know he talks slow and he but he you know deliberate and he said that he, he was just hopping and uh, it, like it was out of control and um, the major saw him there, and um, he come running over to him. The major did to to Leslie, and uh, major told him, and he's telling me this. He said the major told me to give him his uh, grenade launcher, and he said, "No, I'm not." And he said he put his hand on his pistol, and he said, "Give me the grenade launcher." And he said, "I'm not giving it to you," and he pulled out his pistol out and put it to his head and cocked it and said, give me that grenade launcher, and he just tossed it at him, and the major was gone. Charging in the battle again? Or he didn't know where he went after that. Disappeared. So Dalton's got his 45 on him, and um, there was a lot of wounded, and uh, he, uh, he started looking at wounded and then there was guys still out on the field that were wounded and he and a couple other guys went out started bringing uh, wounded Marines back and uh, he said uh, I, I interviewed just as an interview I interviewed Dan Wackety earlier this morning and he was telling me different things and he was one of the tanks that they loaded the wounded on to take back. I don't know if you, you know that or not, but oh, yeah. he took the tanks. And he was talk, referring to a, a captain, and I hadn't heard that there was a captain there. So that's why I asked you about the captain talk to the major, because I didn't know that. I thought there were a couple of lieutenants, and I didn't, know, I didn't know the major was present. I thought he was in the back, he was, you know. But 
Wackety said that the, the he talked about a captain and taking taking some of the wounded back on the tank, that and then they and then I'm sorry, McPherson, that McPherson, and and that they they were told that they had to leave the bodies there till the next day because it was getting dark or it's so dark or whatever would. Well, they brought the wax back that day. That's okay. You're well, in this, the, you're in the tank ballpark. Or, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it was late at night when the event occurred. Got so it. it might have been sunrise, but it was not the next day. Got it. Got it. So, uh, Leslie, he said, uh, him and a couple other guys went out and uh, they went up to Sergeant Zephyrin's and uh, to bring him back. And uh, you know, I always remember it. <clears throat> He, uh, he said, um, you know, the other two guys got a hold of him on the side and he said uh, his head wound was, was seared very, very bad. And uh, he said, held him by the neck as his head was so bad. And he said, I was careful with him. Uh -huh. Respectful. Yeah. Because I know he's your friend. And, uh, he said, I could feel his veins and his neck pounding in my fingers, but his brains were running in between my fingers too. And uh, he said, by the time we got back to the truck, the pounding had stopped. So, <clears throat> take your time. But I thought, you know, for a, you know, a guy, um, to go through all that and then, you know, <clears throat> still say, you know, still say, you know, I was careful with him because yeah. um, he's your friend. Yeah. So that was, you know, Leslie, uh, you know, you know, did what he could you know, with the, after that and bringing the guys back. And then it kind of, that was it. They, uh, only two guys from that unit that came back uh, that, that weren't wounded or dead. And that was Leslie and one other Marine uh, that I don't recall who he was. I know his name was Mike. I spoke with him. I spoke with both of them. Uh, that, that were there. That came, yeah. that were there yeah. of the squad that, yeah. Would, would have been the original squad that I knew about and that I had would have had something to do with, but I, but I didn't because Jim Sefrens took my place. But I spoke with both of them and uh, Mike, I wish we knew his last name because I haven't been able to look for him. You can't look, put Mike on Google and, and get any kind of reasonable answer. But Mike was, he was a, a Filipino and he looked 12 or 13 until he, until he came back. And I know I've heard in my life many stories about things happen and they age. Well, he came back, he went out, whatever he looked like and however young, he came back a man. And there was no question. And both he and Leslie also had a bullet hole through his the sling uh, on whatever. No, I'm sorry. Michael had a, a bullet hole through his sling. And both Leslie and Mike had bullet holes through the flap of their uh, utilities the, on, on, their, on their ass. Uh, and, and they were very uh, deeply changed by what they had witnessed. Now that would be the, the morning after, as they came back in. And one other thing, I don't know if you can remember it exactly, but when, when you mentioned that uh, Seferns was treating one of the wounded when he was shot in the head, uh, one of the R.J. Harrison's uh, first-hand report, do that's, you remember it? Yeah, that's part that of was my... The third, yeah. Yeah. My, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my assignment from the colonel was, uh, he called it a favor. Would you do me a favor? Because my flight date was February 14th. Oh, wow. And few knew that Seferens' flight date was February 18th. Mm -hmm. He had just come back January 25th 
from a 30-day R&R following his second extension of six months. They had reversed it, and he was informed that he was to go home. All of that information was kept uh, from all of us, except for Jim and I, because I was the guy who pulled the numbers out of the hat for your flight date. And I pulled it out for Jim, and it was the 18th, and Steve's was the 9th, and mine was the 14th. Seferin's and I were uh, together for over 13 months. I was involuntarily extended twice. Seferin's had volunteered to extend once, went home to Chicago for a 30-day leave, and had come, come back and met his fate. The reports I took from R.J. Harrison and Leslie Dalton and a few others, I, I believe that number was seven, gave a completely different story than the colonel had heard from the officers involved. I prepared the report, I signed it, I personally presented it to the colonel, and I sat there while he read it, and he said, who did you talk to? Because this is not the same information that I was given. Seferins got up, went to the aid of a wounded Marine. Seferins was a big guy, strong as a bull. Put the, sh put the Marine on his shoulder, got him to safe haven. Went back, got a second. I'm getting goosebumps, okay? Went and got this is the this is the eyewitness accounts from the enlisted absolutely. men. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And and that. officers. R. J. Harrison was a was a lieutenant, okay. first lieutenant, and he was the legal officer for First Tank Battalion. Okay, and I worked directly for R. J. And he too was a great guy. We can't find him or he'd be here. We, I had numerous accounts, including Dalton's, of the major's involvement. The weapon that was taken from Dalton was for his own protection, not to charge the field. He never went back in the field. However, Seferins's form and my submission was altered after the fact. The colonel was given, excuse me, the major was given a silver star and Jim was downgraded to a bronze star and it has haunted me my entire life. I didn't find out until another returning Marine called me at my home in California and said, your report got changed, Major got a silver star, they downgraded Jim after he saved at least two Marines, one Arvin, and was at the aid of a wounded Marine when he took one round in the head. And I'll never overcome. Jack, did yeah, you hear yeah. any? Oh yes. Yeah, uh, yeah Jack knows stuff yeah. that we yeah. wouldn't otherwise in, in, know. In further, further the story. Yes, uh, I. Uh, we had an awards board. Dicky was the head of it because he was senior. And who's Dicky? He was the executive officer, the major that they're talking about. Uh, battalion. Yes. And uh, so that put me then as the next person in line as far as the, being the chairman of the promotion board, uh, the award board, board, board. And the night of the issue, uh, I had a, one of the staff NCOs that had been out there and had witnessed exactly uh, some of these things. He, uh, the witness, he witnessed the major taking... Uh, 779. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And uh, he came to see me and he said, you've got to stop that. He said, you're going to be the awards board. Uh, and he said, you have to go to the, the colonel and tell him that uh, you have to stop this from happening. Well, uh, I did go to see uh, the colonel. And as soon as I told him 
about these incidents, and I said, your staff NCOs came to me to, to have that stopped. And he said, it's already gone forward. He said, I'm not going to stop it. It's already gone forward. And at that point, uh, I think the messenger was the one that was going to get it. Uh, he was upset. Uh, and uh, As he should have been. Yeah. <laughs> Embarrassed. A horrible disgrace. Embarrassed. Horrible disgrace. Well, things went on later. Uh, and there is a member of this group and the other group who just happened to be in the officer's mess when it was being discussed on the other side of the divider uh, that night. And uh, it, the colonel mentioned to the people who were involved in that of uh, the staff having gone to me. And he said, you know, uh, I don't know what he's going to do with it. And uh, another major uh, said, I know him. He's not going to do anything with it. He will not go beyond here. And uh, he's, so they did discuss this. And he said, if you try and pull it now back from division, uh, it's going to screw up your award when you leave and you don't want that to happen. So uh, it got down to that level of deceit uh, and that I didn't learn about until just a couple of years ago when the fellow that was on the other side of that divider said I heard everything. Mm -hmm. And so they knew what was going on. They knew that about the incident that you're talking about, I told them because of his staff came to me. And I said, these are your staff and COs for God's sakes. And uh, well, it was that whole incident was an upsetting incident. I can tell you that. You know what, uh, the company was never the same. I was there. February, March, I left in April, and um, it, it, it was yeah. just empty. And, uh, you know, it. Uh, and we're still empty. You know, it, it, well, you're talking to others too, and uh, it, it just, uh, just doesn't go away. Yeah. When the Silver Star was presented? At Battalion. Off Battalion, because I was the next senior. I had to stand out in front, and I, I can't tell you how I felt. I didn't want to do it, but the, uh, I had to. You're a Marine. Oh, uh, but it was everybody that was behind me, uh, I think, objected. Just on a personal note, one of the guys was Greg Lundy, who was in my platoon and boot camp. In fact, he was in the same hooch, the same Quonset hut and hooch, and we went to tank school together, and we were fifth tanks together. And I heard about it about six months later, you know, just on the grapevine. But he was he was also in the, on the patrol. He was killed. He was in my tent along with Sefrens. Yeah. Well, uh, I can say this too, though, that uh, the colonel ended up retiring right after that. And he became a banker in Philadelphia, his home. Is he still around? Oh, no. He died. I said, go, go, go. He had either cancer or one of the other fatal diseases. Mm -hmm. And within months, he was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, Something about major, payback. Yep. Yep. The major, one of the other majors in the battalion at that time who stayed in and went up to full colonel, and his job uh, when he was a full colonel was to go around to all the I and I's and inspect them. And he went to the one that Dickie 
or the major. Uh, he went to the one that uh, Dickey was in charge of. And he had to hold an, o an open hearing for anybody that had complaints. And there were women there that acute made accusations against him, plus the audit for the monies that they handled was such that they found he was guilty of theft. Now, because of that Silver Star, they, he was offered the opportunity to resign, not retire, but resign. And uh, that's what happened to him. But you see, he was, he was screwed up, period. From the beginning? Yeah. Before? He didn't just get rotten overnight. He's a criminal. Yeah. yeah. That's a shame. What? And, and good men were killed. Yes. And, and didn't get the recognition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And died. Which, that which is probably service. as big a tragedy as getting killed. Yes. It's a bigger know? tragedy, in my opinion. You know, you, you know because that we're all going to die, right. but we right. need to be remembered right. or, as or, we righteously deserve. Right. And Jim, if anyone, right. uh, of any one of us, for sure, absolutely. You well, know, Leslie, Leslie deserved to be recognized for bringing Washington back. And down to think. Uh, and um, yeah, no. Have you been in contact with him at all? No. 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 You can't find well, him. can't find him. Leslie. Yeah. Leslie is. I, be, I believe he's. We believe he's. he's I believe he's uh, the ten guy. Yeah. Yeah. That he was a victim of a a, a one car accident. Oh. Uh, he, my. But we, we're not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. Sure. No. I was going to say that the leadership of the other association all know all about this incident because it has been in their newsletters ever since, you know, it ended. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, they all knew about what really, well, Casey being one of them, they all knew the truth of what happened. Bob Johnson, who was in the S2 mm -hmm. at the time, they all know the truth of what happened. And said nothing. Well, what were they going to say? The colonel said, "Don't do it." Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're, you're Casey a, was. Yeah. You're a marine, you know, and none of us. I, I didn't find out about it till I was I was home, mm -hmm. and at, at the ripe young age of 21, and then uh, no longer an active marine. What power do I have? Who's going to believe? No. Because I didn't know where Larry was, and I didn't know where Steve was, right. and some 40 years later, and I didn't know where Jack was either, some 40 years later, we start reunioning as a result of Steve's efforts to locate us all. We've located 29 guys, 23 are still living, and we've lost some in between, obviously. Uh, but, you know, our group is, is healthy and strong, and there isn't... Only because meeting, of each other. Yeah, but there isn't a meeting that we don't have, and we reunion every year, yeah. okay, um, that we don't set a place. We set an empty place mm -hmm. for Jim Seffrens and the rest of our fallen brothers, and we will forever. Great. You know, John, they're, uh, you, know, at the, you know, at the worker bee level, um, you take, and, you know, five guys died. And then the, the the wounded, and there's no really n a number of wounded, but basically just about everyone that went out on that. Um, you know, there was guys from Bravo Company; they were from all over. There was no one to talk about it. They were they weren't there. You know, two guys came back, and who's going to listen to a lance corporal? You know, if the major is stonewalled. <laughs> Where's the Lance Corporal going? Way back, way back, I think the first mention of this was, was it Terry Hightower? So, somebody wrote a story, it was in the sponsoring box, 
and then right from there we did we did the program from from First Tank Battalion when they had the when they had the memorial service thing. We did that in the we featured that in Sponsor Bucks. So there's somebody it was Ted was Hildebrand. 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 I, okay. I contacted him. Yeah. I was, wanted him I to sit to me, with he us. He was the first one to spark this whole kind of resurgence of this. Well, to me, he he for you, but he he didn't spark it for us, but uh, and didn't even rekindle it because once I had heard it. Uh, I went home, as I had mentioned earlier, I was gone in three days. And I, I had other things to look forward to. I, I was married, in, uh, 18 days later I got married. From coming home? From coming home, 18 days from yeah. the incident. Yeah. Oh, from the incident, okay. I, I, it, was, it was two days, three days later you went home, right? From, that's right, yeah, exactly. Right. So I didn't I, know, I, I knew the crap that happened, I knew that our brothers had died. I knew of the original 12 guys that if it hadn't been the Tet Offensive, if it hadn't been the NVA, if it hadn't, if, if we were called down on something else, they likely would have gone out, because we usually did, even without an officer. Out of those, starting with that 14, two guys came back that night. They, they were injured and, and four dead. Uh, but th that was the knowledge that I came home with, and, and that's all I held that night. Now there was somebody else killed right adjacent to it within a click. There's a five. Yeah, I, one of them. Yeah, yeah, but one was from the other, the other group, the the add on group, or that's the way I was told. Yeah. I'm not even sure. That's true. Right. And then somebody else was killed like a half a click away, right. in the same day from, uh, and and then we lost other guys too yeah. that we know of because Jack. Uh, was killed on that same date at, at a different incident. Uh, but I, as Joe had just mentioned, it was 40 years before I knew the depth of when it, when it, it was a great joy for me, by the way, to get back, <laughs> to get back in, touch, uh, in touch with Jack. It's uh, a great joy for all of us. Uh, thank you. But when, I, when I did... It's nice to be seen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jack... Uh, told me some of the stuff he just shared about the, uh, that he knew from, we love you, but from a different point of view, you know, <laughs> command, command, uh, you know, officers and the command structure, and we're, as Larry said, the work would be to hear the same concerns, the same heart, right. and the same uh, unfortunate uh, result. Yes, the same unfortunate John, result. John, what was the name of that, uh, the TC from the Alpha Tank? That was over there. Yeah. Dan Wackety. Dan Wackety. Yeah, yeah. 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 He wrote about it. I think, yeah. He was. Uh, he was the second article ago. that was in the sponsor box, right? Yeah. Right. And, and from um, his perspective. I uh, I had a chance. Um, we came back off the hill, you know, shortly after uh, the, the February sixth. Might have been around the eighth, and uh, they had brought uh, Jack's tank back, and uh, I think most everyone got. Wounded on that, uh, the tank commander. There, were, a fire started, and uh, when that RPG came through, and uh, guys got burned, and, and that, and uh, so, you remember the tank? Uh, they, anyway, they needed to offload the ammo, and so uh, they could weld up the hole, and had to get off the ammo off. So, me and Joe were up there, and some other guys, and uh, well, they, it was closed, and we opened up that that hatch, and. It had been closed for days, and it was really, really, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and we before anyone could go in there, we had to clean up the blood and the tissue, and you know, from that and body parts. It was, uh, and because this was my friend, you know, and uh, but we we finished, and uh, and uh, I talked with. Uh, there was a guy sitting on a tank, you know, like not too far on the ramp there, and. Uh, I just, he'd been sitting there, and I, the whole time I went over there just because he was just sitting by himself, and that, that was, uh, he was the TC of that tank, and he was uh, just, just so, felt so bad because he had been sent out there, but then ordered not to fire, not to fire, and, um, I, and he just was beside himself to, to be there and be ordered not to fire, and um, they, he got hit with a, 
a lot, a number of RPGs from an extreme distance, and he had lost his 50 and his searchlight and his water can, and then he was called back so they wouldn't lose a tank that he was told not to fire. Wow. The, uh, one other. We should wrap it up. Now, yeah. from your, from your, just one more point. Sure. From your point of view, you also had the uh, the launch site. Isn't that correct? In, in you had identified the launch site and were no. Refused. That was another. That was another. Oh, I uh, thought that incident. was the same incident. No, no. That no, was he, uh, when the bridge blew. Yeah, he didn't find out about it. That's yeah. for three days. No, I know that, but I, I, I thought. Uh, no, not from I, the RPGs. That was. Uh, no, not the RPGs, but uh, a mortar, mortar. Uh, or rockets on enough, the was, bridge. That, that was, was a quite a bit trip. earlier. Yeah. Uh, Larry screwed me up. I thought that was the same damn thing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you very much.